Mr. Okay, perfect. So um, welcome everybody to the September uh, webinar of the Barcelona Regional Dust Center. So I, I, it's a pleasure for me to, to welcome the speaker of today, who is James King from the University of Montreal. Uh, James uh, obtained a PhD in Canada as an expert on uh, uh, shear stress uh, dynamics uh, and uh, wind erosion. So after some postdoc experience in the UK and the US, uh, he, he went back to the University of uh, Montreal and is now where he's now associate professor in geomorphology. So today we will uh, speak about uh, high latitude uh, dust, so especially the challenge uh, related to identify the sources and the mechanism in uh, uh, dust at high latitudes. So please uh, uh, go ahead. James, and thank you for uh, joining us. Great, uh, thank you, Emmanuel. Um, uh, and thanks to BSC uh, and WMO to, to inviting me to do this uh, webinar. Uh, so, um, and, and thanks for people for, for joining me. So today I'm gonna talk about um, a little bit of, of work that I've been uh, dedicating some time to more recently uh, to basically identify ways that we can not only um, uh, get a better estimate of dust emissions from high latitudes in terms of uh, total contributions of, of dust loading, um, but more generally on the emission process uh, within cold climates more generally um, that we find at high, high latitudes uh, today. Um, and so this is work uh, th that's done by, by, by many people and I, I sort of will acknowledge them along the way um, that are sort of leading the, these different components of the project. Uh, but I first wanted to kind of go back a little bit uh, to kind of see what we know from, from lower latitudes and, and see what kind of applies at high latitudes or in cold climates and, and what doesn't and, and why that might be the case. Uh, so we know uh, at Low latitudes uh, due to you know, in, increase in, in um, remote sensing technologies. Uh, so this is an example from MODIS in, in 2014, that dust storms uh, have, and, and dust emission processes have, have, a, a, have a global uh, kind of circulation uh, potential. Um, and this is, this is quite important uh, for, for many things. This, uh, is a transporter of nutrients. Uh, it, it provides some radiative effects um, uh, that both are, are limiting and, and also have uh, um, positive uh, uh, contributions uh, within the atmosphere. And those emissions are are generally, and, and the transport of them are are at a at a global synoptic scale. So we have we have large mesoscale and larger patterns that are have the ability to to transport those. Um, at a slightly smaller scale, we, we have sort of much more synoptic or, or mesoscale type um, events uh, that, that can also transport dust, uh, but it's normally limited uh, to, to smaller relative to, to global circulation. And so here's a great example uh, from the Space Shuttle Endeavor in, in 1992 uh, of a, a very classic cold pool outflow. Um, and you can even see some cumulus clouds developing on the, on the front edge of that. Um, and, you know, this is a great example of the types of mechanisms that we see at, at mid-latitudes that are a strong component. Um, and so people have looked at this specifically uh, within this region of Algeria and, and, and sort of in, in the North African uh, uh, low pressure areas where you, you have a strong contribution from not only these very large mesoscale events, um, but these cold pool outflows, uh, but also some smaller scale events as well. And so here's a, a really good example from just this summer uh, down in Southern Africa of, of dust being sort of swept off the, the coastline. And here, you know, we're into a different mechanism process. And so these are usually um, some component is, is 
responsible for those dust emissions from what's called a berg wind, uh, which is kind of like a, a thermal drainage wind uh, that comes off uh, the, the coastline due to the topography uh, along that coast. And so here we have, you know, very small point sources that are, are being uh, enhanced in terms of their emission capabilities uh, due to the mechanism that's, that's actually transporting the dust itself. And so these are just some of the examples that we have um, from mid latitudes that are, um, you know, being quite relatively well known uh, and being studied uh, by by many groups uh, to try and understand their their uh, their processes. And so, um, I probably don't need to explain to this group, but there's a lot. Of, obviously, these there's uh, you know impacts associated with these, whether they're direct. Uh, kind of health, there's uh, direct and in, indirect radiative effects. So uh, as cloud nuclei and um, uh, that, that have been studied also uh, by other things than just remote sensing. And so all of these kind of contribute to our, our body of knowledge um, to, to dust emission processes. Um, and so what I want to do is sort of take all that in con in consideration and, and ask a very simple question is, is how do we get that dust storm to begin? So what, what are the processes kind of more generally, uh, sort of conceptually, uh, what do we know about them for, for lower latitudes and sort of what, what can we pick out of that? That, that applies for, for colder climates or, or high latitudes um, or you know, what does it and, and what, what do we need to change within that um, so that we can actually, um, we can get a better idea of, of what those estimates might might look like and and where those emissions might be occurring. Uh, so what I'm going to do is is basically uh, I've adapted this approach from from uh, Rice et al. Uh, in '99, um, and this was this work uh, at that point was really driven um, by a lot of small scale processes, uh, even wind tunnel uh, type processes uh, by like Ted Zoback and in 91 and, and Yaping and, and at all in 1993, where we were able to start to come up with some idea of the kinetic energy that, you know, an impacting sand grain or, or the wind itself would actually be contributing to removing mass and, and transporting that. And so this is a very simple approach where we have energy uh, as, a, as a, a relative scale on the, on the x-axis and we have the probability of that energy uh, uh, on the y-axis. And so we're starting here with the impact energy, uh, which is mostly related to wind before threshold. Um, and so this has a, a, a Weeble distribution uh, more generally, um, but that, that distribution will, will start to change a little bit once, once we reach threshold and we, we start actually transporting some sediment. On the other side, uh, we have the binding energy. So this is basically what's what's limiting the the movement of that sediment. So in, in mid latitudes, um, you know, a lot of the considerations are uh, based on uh, particle size, uh, but it's also based on uh, soil moisture, um, and then kind of more generally, uh, that contributes a little bit to both is is say like the partitioning due to roughness, be it. Um, sort of uh, non-removable elements such as, as rocks and gravel, uh, all the way up to uh, vegetation uh, of some kind. And so we can kind of look at this as, as sort of, you know, wh where's the best case scenario where we might get erosion? So when the binding energy potential is, is actually quite, quite low um, and the impact energy is, is quite high. And so all the examples that I just showed is, are really good examples of that, where we have really large, um, atmospheric drivers that, that produce a high wind event. Um, and then we're generally in, in locations where, you know, uh, soil moisture is quite low. There's a lot of sediment availability to, to seasonal cycles of, of producing um, that, that sediment uh, within, those, within those regions. So if we look uh, um, at a global distribution of dust storms based on those uh, on those assumptions, uh, Paul Janu and, and friends uh, came up with uh, this map in, in 2012 that, that is um, um, an output of, of remote sensing as well as other uh, more in-depth approaches uh, that that links to hydrology and, and anthropogenic effects. Um, and, but generally, we can kind of see a, a distribution of this. And, and this is, um, you know, uh, there, there's been a very recent uh, updates to this, uh, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, by Danny Lung and, and Jasper Koch. But basically, you know, this is the state of, of our idea of how we get to a global distribution of uh, emission areas. 
And so, you know, these have been um, kind of qualified and verified um, more generally and, and more specifically, depending on, on the approach through remote sensing from satellite or remote sensing uh, from ground and also uh, say flight campaigns and, and in situ measurements. Um, and then from that, we can use those directly uh, to verify and calibrate regional and, and global climate models. And so we kind of have this cycle uh, that we go through um, to, to try and validate that those approaches. One of the limitations for this, for, for high latitudes specifically, is that this map doesn't have any. Um, and so we're, we're really at a, at, a, at a kind of starting point uh, within looking at um, kind of the processes and the contributions that high latitude dust emissions might present uh, within the global framework. And so uh, this has started to, to come online um, probably within the last 10 years to be more and more attention uh, to this, um, um, starting with, with uh, Joanna Bullard's group uh, and, and sort of her, her looking at this um, in a more kind of cohesive uh, component. Um, and then this is a, an example uh, taken from the UNCCCD uh, Santa Dust Storm uh, source base map that looks at kind of maximum source intensity based on, on kind of potential due to sediment size. And so we can see that there is, there's a potential for dust emissions from these, these latitudes. Um, I'm only showing the Northern hemisphere here, but, um, but we don't really have a good idea of, of what that is. Um, and so what, why do we care? And so, you know, there, there has been estimates. So I mentioned the Joe, Joe Buller paper um, that has around, you know, a 5% estimate. There's been other estimates, uh, say by um, uh, uh, Christine uh, Gruvig, who, who basically did a, a, um, a modeling study that has somewhere between sort of maybe three to 6% uh, of the global dust loading is from, uh, from the Northern high latitude regions. Um, and so, you know, it's it's not a it's you know not a huge amount, but it's it's not a small amount. So this, depending on the year, is is something similar to what you would see from the U.S. Southwest or or say from from Australia, um, and so you know this is considerable. Um, but in addition to that, so it's not only the amount; it, it's sort of what that that amount is doing. And so this is a great um, kind of diagram um, um, from O.T. Meander's uh, uh, summary paper uh, recently published. Um, that shows, you know, what this dust at those high latitudes could be doing. And so, um, one thing that's 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 quite different compared to lower latitudes is we have a, a very large uh, seasonal variability. Uh, most of these latitudes are are completely dark uh, in in winter, and so we and you know very 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 cold. Um, and so, whatever emissions we have there is is very limited in terms of of, of distance and, and and transport capacity. Um, and then we go through a very large kind of melting uh, season in the, in the spring. It also, uh, due to glacier melt, but also to, to snow melt, we also have the chance for precipitation depending on, on the location. And so we have this sudden influx of sediment kind of annually, um, almost, almost guaranteed uh, depending on the location. Uh, and then this contributes to the, the sediment availability uh, for the wind to take place uh, over. Uh, the wind patterns themselves, which I'll talk about in a little bit, um, are, are significantly different. So the, the three kind of large uh, categories that, that I presented before, um, they, they, they have kind of different, um, different patterns that we see at higher latitudes, and they, they are all kind of components there, um, but they definitely have different characteristics. And so what that generally generates uh, due to uh, the lower temperature and the lower, lower convective uh, uh, state of, of the atmosphere is we have quite shallow boundary layers. And so there's been a lot of studies um, that have looked at that specifically. Um, um, uh, so uh, so Matt Baddock uh, through, with Joe Bullard. Um, there's a paper also um, by Joe Prospero that kind of looked out, out of Iceland. And so a lot of these seem to map or, or give a consideration that, that most of these emissions are, are relatively being emitted lower in the atmosphere uh, due to this capping um, uh, because of the, the reduction in, in convective properties within, within those boundary layers. Um, and so this, this has implications. And so not only perhaps this has less of an radiative impact um, due to the longevity of uh, the emissions within the atmosphere uh, being sort of trapped within that. Um, but 
they can also be more concentrated. So the emissions that we do have are actually being concentrated close to the surface and then have a direct radiative impact uh, that's much more strongly felt at, at the surface level compared to at lower latitudes where, well, that would be dispersed over a larger um, um, atmospheric layer. This also have, means that it's being kind of deposited in, in the near, uh, the near uh, field. And so being in, in a kind of cryospheric region, you have more potential that of, of the dust acting as a black body, uh, radiatively speaking, and um, melting ice and, and snow at, at a faster rate, uh, as we've seen uh, in, in sort of lots of works in the US Southwest um, uh, by Jeff Monroe and, and other people. And so we, we see this kind of direct impact um, due to that. Uh, so I mentioned briefly sort of the, the local and synoptic uh, meteorology is important and, and this uh, is, is well known within the, the glacier community and so we have these thermally driven winds or catabatic flows um, that are almost like a, a sea breeze and so we can have almost like a daily um, emission potential uh, uh, due to that. Uh, and then the last point that I want to just emphasize is that um, these, these environments are basically isolated otherwise. Um, so uh, as I said, in winter, everything's quite frozen. Um, in summer, we start to get streams moving and, and you know maybe a glacier shifting a little bit more. And so we do have some movement of sediment within those valleys, but they're very constrained. And so they're, they're very much stuck in, in these uh, well-incised uh, watersheds. Um, and so there's not a lot of potential for the, the, the total ecosystem to actually have benefit from any of those ge geomorphic processes. And so um, any dust emissions that do take place, and I'm going to show potentially why the, some of that is increasing um, of, of, of late, um, that actually is providing either a positive contribution through, through nutrients or, or a negative contribution, depending on what's, what's in that dust and, and the radiative impact that may have on, on ecosystems. Uh, so there's been a, a couple of attempts to kind of cate categorize and, and catalog where uh, high latitude uh, uh, dust sources are. Um, and so uh, this is the, the Bullard paper in 2016 that, that took a kind of summary approach. And so sort of, there's a couple of categories here of, of um, dust sources. Some are, uh, so sort of the black triangles are actual places where, where dust uh, events have been been located through remote sensing or field studies. Um, and then the um, the yellow uh, circles are actually pulled by uh, from a from a paper of Engelschotter um, that used uh, WMO codes to basically look at the the kind of dust blowing and things like that. And so we, we do have this very large potential based on meteorological reports, but we don't have a lot of ground truthing of that. Um, and that has a lot to do with the remote sensing approach that we rely on for, for lower latitudes that doesn't work very well at high latitudes. And I, I'm going to talk a lot about that in a little bit, but basically, um, you know, higher latitudes have almost, you know, a very omnipresent uh, cloud base that's that's quite low to the ground or, or is, is has ice clouds that's quite high in the atmosphere that render some of those remote sensing approaches uh, uh, very difficult uh, to apply. Um, and then we also just don't have access to these areas. You know, as, as hard as it is uh, getting into areas in lower latitudes um, due to, to political reasons or uh, just general transport reason, getting into higher latitudes have sort of a, a, an actual uh, kind of transport issue. Um, and so a lot of these areas are very hard to access and even harder to maintain instrumentation at. And so we, we have a kind of lack of knowledge of, of where this might be. This, this was uh, updated and, and kind of changed in the, the Utimenander paper, um, which, which basically focused only on areas where we have kind of um, local uh, observations of these emissions. Uh, and you can see a lot of them are concentrated around areas where, where there's some population. Um, and that's not always the case, but the, the majority of that is, is true here. Um, and so this is just sort of a, a speckling of the potential based on the uh, SDS map that I showed earlier of, of where we could imagine uh, dust emissions to be occurring. Um, and so what do these look like? So I mentioned that they're relatively a small contribution in terms of the global dust loading. Um, nonetheless, they're, they're actually quite prominent events. And so when we do have good coverage uh, through a remote sensing, remote sensing, we can see that they actually are um, quite large scale events. Um, and so they're driven not just by 
say, um, one valley's uh, kind of thermal gradient uh, producing some kind of wind, there are strong synoptic uh, drivers that could be producing dust emissions at this level. And so here's an example in southern Iceland, uh, caught by Modis. Um, here's another in the Copper River, uh, which is in southwestern Alaska. Again, you can see plumes uh, of sort of hundreds of kilometers. Um, one thing you may realize in these cases that they're they're actually quite similar to uh, the Southern African example that I gave earlier, uh, where we see sort of linear features, uh, especially in the case of the Copper River, of, of dust emissions kind of coming off the land and, and over the ocean. And so this prompts some other questions um, associated with, you know, what what is the iron content of that dust and, and what is it contrib contributing to the, to the ocean and the fertilization of the ocean relative to say um, the river material that's also coming out of that same, same valley. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about that too much today, um, but there's been a bunch of work that was led by John Crucius um, and, and colleagues that has been kind of revisited, especially in the Copper River um, that, that kind of tries to look at that comparison uh, and and pretty much shows that the dust actually has a, a, a more uh, viable um, contribution of uh, iron for oxidation uh, than what you get from the river sediments uh, from the same sources. Uh, lastly, here's an example that kind of goes against uh, the, the other two in that uh, the dust plume is actually not parallel to the valley at all. And so this really kind of reinforces that there are other drivers other than these thermal gradients uh, built within these glacier valleys uh, that are actually producing the wind for, for, for the dust. Um, and so if we go back uh, to my little uh, conceptual model, um, we, need to, we need to adjust some things here. So we need to add some things and, and maybe take some things away um, compared to our, our knowledge from, from lower latitudes. Um, so on the binding energy side, we suddenly have a snow cover. We have a lot of seasonal contributions uh, of sediment uh, due to flooding, uh, but we also have the flooding itself. And so there's a large seasonal variability, almost daily variability in, in water cover within these valleys. Uh, for anyone who's hiked in areas with, with that are glacier fed, um, when you walk up that over that stream in the morning, uh, it's at a very small uh, level uh, compared to when you walk back at the end of the day uh, due to all that insulation that it received uh, during the day. And so we see this very predominantly uh, within the valleys, um, maybe not at the head of the valleys, but where you get into sort of the regions uh, where most of the dust emissions are occurring. So where they meet lakes or, or, or the ocean. Uh, we also have frozen soil um, and, and various versions of that frozen soil. So you can have areas with permafrost, um, uh, seasonally um, active permafrost, um, areas that are just frozen soil. Um, and so we have sort of a soil moisture limiting factor, but that, that's complicated by uh, some other processes um, that, that are very specific to the cryosphere. On the impact energy side, uh, you know, there's there's other contributions uh, such as differences in air density. Uh, we have we have particles that are, are quite brittle due to their temperature. There's free thaw freeze thaw processes that that contribute um, to perhaps spalling or, or or different types of, of particle breakdown uh, that we don't see at lower latitudes. I've already mentioned the shallow atmosphere, uh, and then we have, of course we have these thermally driven flows or catabatic flows um, that I mentioned. So overall, there there needs to be some some changes on how we perhaps um, identify the thresholds for these areas, um, but then also perhaps modify the ways that the emissions are occurring uh, due to the way the particles are uh, auto abrading or, or, or generally being emitted. Um, so thermally uh, um, driven winds or, or um, catabatic winds is, is one of those um, in, in particular, uh, basically is on the erosivity or impact energy side of things. And so they, they are basically a, um, uh, it's a thermal gradient between the glacier surface and, and the valley below uh, that drives um, a, an almost daily type cycle of winds down, down valley uh, late in the afternoon. Um, and so a lot of these models have been developed in the Alps and in um, the Rockies in the United States. Um, and, and they're really much triggered by sunrise and, and sunset type categorization. However, in high latitudes, um, starting at 60 degrees in May, we almost don't have a sunset. And so a lot of the theories that are related to the drivers for these thermally driven winds 
um, are actually not very applicable at, at higher latitudes. Um, and so we have to kind of rethink on, on how much of these winds that we normally attribute to catabatics are actually catabatics, or whether there's some synoptic processes that are, are actually playing a, a larger component. And I'm going to talk about some of the work that a uh, student of mine have been, has been doing uh, recently on that. On the erodibility side, so I mentioned some of these things, um, and I'm just kind of giving these examples to say that, you know, this is, um, my group's not the first that, that's looked at this. So this is John Crucius et al. that looked at the um, Col Colorado River in Alaska. Uh, and so here we can see a really good example of uh, the winds in, in a bar graph uh, behind uh, the river discharge in the dash line and the snow depth in, in the solid line over a series of months. Um, and so we can see that we almost have no possibility of dust emissions in, in the winter months. So starting in around probably end of end of November, uh, all the way into April, let's say, or maybe even May due to snow. Um, but then come summer, we have just so much river um, due to precipitation and, and melting of the glacier and the snowpack um, that it, it fills up the valley. And so whatever sediment is produced by that meltwater is, is completely covered. And so wind being a very relatively weak process um, for, for wind erosion, uh, you know, we have a very, very narrow window. And so uh, in this case, uh, Christus et al. really exposed this idea that in their springtime, the crossover between snow cover and river discharge is too narrow. And so even though there is some capability for winds, say in the month of May, uh, to, to cause wind erosion, there, there's no actual surface available. And then uh, in the fall, there actually is a bit of more of a window of opportunity for that. And so uh, the winds are actually stronger there than they are in the spring, um, but that the, the discharge of the river actually starts to decrease before you start seeing snow on the ground. Um, and so this, uh, this study has been um, used quite a lot in, in this uh, kind of analogous way of, of seeing where these windows of opportunity are for, for dust emissions. And so this changes by area. So um, in southwestern Alaska, it, it seems to be the case that that this um, autumn or, or fall in the northern hemisphere is, is actually the kind of viable time for that. Um, and Sarah Barr um, uh, has recently re published a paper um, for, uh, kind of along the, from that area, um, from that time, uh, trying to look at the, the impacts that that may have um, due to the temperature at that time, which is, is relatively warmer than it is in the springtime. And perhaps there's more kind of biogenic material in that dust um, that has a stronger impact on, on cloud processes. Uh, the larger uh, context here and, 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 and why this is an interesting area of, of, of study is that um, the North is, receiving uh, a, a larger proportion of the global warming signature. And so this is a 2016 temperature anomaly, which I'll, I'll explain why it's, I've picked 2016 in, in a second for a specific case study, um, where we see almost a four degree or, or larger warming um, in, in some regions in, in the Northern hemisphere uh, re relative to the, to the global. Um, and so what does this mean uh, for these high latitude sources? Well, firstly, we know that means that we'll have more ice loss uh, from these glaciers. And so that does kind of two things. The one is it produces more water, which potentially limits the amount of dust emissions that we could be having because it will cover that sediment. Um, but it also, uh, it, also, it also means we're producing more sediment uh, within each melt cycle. And so we suddenly have kind of potentially more chance of, of dust emissions. And so this is a... This is just a total mass of, of, of water loss uh, from glaciers around the world. Um, this is just more of a chart that's actually weighted uh, by the area of those glaciers. And we can see that in Northern Hemisphere, such as in Alaska, Western Canada, Arctic Canadian North, um, but also in the Southern Hemisphere, high latitude sources, such as the Southern Andes and Antarctica, we see this kind of quite a large increase in loss of ice mass in comparison to, to the rest of the world. And so this becomes sort of a bit of a theme on, on where, where could we be looking for, for dust emissions uh, within these regions. I'm not gonna talk about it today, but there's been a lot of work in a more of a historical context. So in the last glacial maximum, uh, we had lots of, uh, of wind erosion. We had a lot of area available for that and a lot of processes um, that would contribute quite favorably, such as large ice masses, um, cold temperatures, uh, very windy, um, and a lot of exposed unvegetated land. And so there's been a work, lot of work in that done by in, in Europe, um, uh, by um, 
you know, Bertrand is, is one example, uh, but this, you know, his colleagues in France, but also uh, some other um, uh, people working that in, in, in Poland and, and in Germany. Um, and then Dan Muse and, and, and friends have, have sort of worked on that quite, quite extensively in, in Alaska. And some of that is coming online now where um, cold climate at, at a glacial scale, uh, dust emission models have been applied or, or trying to be applied, um, but are generally just kind of taking the low latitude versions and, and applying it there with, with a couple of adjustments. And uh, our, our work, which I'm gonna show now is, is basically trying to see whether that's appropriate uh, and how, how we could try and uh, change that moving forward. Uh, so I'm going to talk about kind of three three related projects. One is kind of looking at the detection of high latitude dust. One is looking at the dynamics of emissions, and then one is uh, kind of a, a work in progress that's looking at the modeling of the of, of the dust emission process itself. Uh, so the detection, as I mentioned, we you know we have we have various tools that we use at lower latitudes, uh, and um, that are from anything from like this, a time lapse camera, up to kind of remote sensing and, and other types of observations. Um, I'm just showing a, a time lapse camera here because it's it turns out to be a really effective way uh, for these emission sources. Um, they're extremely variable. Uh, as I said, there's generally a, quite a lot of cloud cover that makes the remote sensing, at least from satellite, uh, very difficult. Uh, this is a one day event. Um, there's, you don't really see, you see the sun dim a little bit, but this is um, near the end of May, and so we don't really have a full sunset in this region. Um, and these were a set of uh, sediment traps that were located uh, in that valley just a little bit further up in the picture. And within one day, we basically had a, a small dune get created and, and, and move through those. And so there's quite a lot of sediment moving through these processes, um, but they go you know, pretty much undetected um, due to some of the factors that I already mentioned. And so to look in this a little bit more carefully, so how well we can detect this, um, um, a master's student, Rosie Huck at the University of Sheffield, uh, who's directed by um, Rob Bryant, kind of took some of our data uh, that we've been collecting over the years in, in this one location um, to try and look at this a little bit better. And so we can kind of see um, a, a pattern of, of where perhaps remote sensing works and, and, and maybe doesn't. So the graph that I'm showing here is, is local time on the x-axis and then aerosol optical depth uh, as measured uh, by an AirNet station that's about 12 kilometers downwind uh, of this uh, emission site uh, of the valley. Um, and so in gray are the areas uh, that would be classified as a dust storm uh, if we take sort of a, a normal approach uh, using AOD and angstrom exponent. Um, in this case, this is with 1.0. Um, Aeronet data, um, whereas the pink is actually what we would be qualified as a dust storm based on the, the time lapse imagery. Um, and so this is a, a capture of the event at uh, the, the large peak there, and we can see a little bit of dust, but not too much dust. Um, and then the second peak that comes in the afternoon, we can see that the time lapse camera is, is completely obscured. And then the there's another image there on the left that's kind of a, a cross section of the valley. Um, and you can see sort of why that is, there's there's sort of a large plume occurring. And so there's a little bit of a mismatch compared to what we see with the cameras and, and what we kind of see with, with the remote sensing uh, through Aeronet. And so her paper that was recently published uh, in, in ACP uh, shows that, you know, we're, we're missing not only kind of these small events, but overall we're missing a large component of these events. And so this was done uh, uh, on a monthly scale using the Aeronet data, both at a, a 1.0 and then a 1.5 um, level uh, of quality control. Um, and we came to the conclusion, um, which was already a little bit known at lower latitudes, but this is a, a larger reinforcement at, at higher latitudes, uh, where the cloud screening process for 1.5 and 2.0 data is, is extremely aggressive. Um, and we end up missing over 95% of the dust events. And so what this means in terms of returning uh, some of the inversion products uh, that are only available at 1.5 or 2.0, uh, it, it makes has us a, a kind of a bit of a limitation on, on what we can know about these dust in, in remote areas that, that are remotely sensed, say, through Aeronet. Um, some of the reasons for that are, are um, due to the, the variability um, of the dust event um, and the proximity of the Aeronet. Uh, this is just a map to show that it's not always just that, it's also due to the solar angle. And so depending on the time of the day, the symbol is actually only looking uh, 
kind of away from where the dust is actually being emitted from in this particular uh, geographic location. I'm running a bit on low on time, so I'm going to move kind of speed up a little bit. Uh, another uh, a student of mine uh, uh, directed at the University of Sherbrooke by Norma O'Neill um, kind of took this one step further. We, we got our hands on a LIDAR, uh, thanks to my colleague Richard Washington. Um, and so we put this in place to kind of see uh, how much a LIDAR would actually gain uh, in terms of the uh, information it may have compared to the, the Aeronet um, and what you can see here is a, a trace up to two kilometers of the aerosol optical depth um, and the uh, of the dust in gray and then that of the cloud in, in blue, uh, along with the backscatter. Uh, and so you can you know easily see this this big dust event um, at or just between 2100 and an 0200 UTC uh, at this location. Uh, but you also see some presence of cloud uh, throughout that time as well. And so what Ali did is he, he took all of the, the, the dust AOD um, uh, calculated uh, at, at the location uh, for the, the campaign period and categorized it based on uh, the correlation between what the LIDAR saw in terms of optical uh, depth, what we measured at the surface in terms of dust concentration uh, as a correlation. Uh, and so when they correlated well, we have a DRS or remotely sensed uh, dust event uh, where they're not real correlated, uh, but there was dust. Uh, we have a, a, a non-remotely sensed uh, or DNRS. Uh, dust event. And then we have two other categories that are, that are kind of like unidentified. So the correlations are quite low. Um, and in the case of, of uh, and, and so we weren't really sure uh, whether due to the low uh, dust concentration at the surface, whether it was actually a dust event. Um, but in some cases, the blighter said there was, and sometimes the uh, blighter said there wasn't. And so we can kind of see a couple things in this plot here uh, that has the AOD of the LIDAR on the y-axis and the volumetric dust uh, concentration on, on the x-axis, uh, that there's a clear pattern after a certain threshold um, kind of independent of, of the class classification. Um, and so, um, you know, there, there's there's a strong amount of um, optical depth uh, that should be related to dust emissions, um, but actually aren't well uh, correlated over over the the total time period of of that event. Um, and then if we go below that threshold, we kind of kind of see two branches: uh, one where the the, the local uh, dust concentration measurements reach some kind of minimum, um, and so they don't really get a, a good idea of of the concentration, um, and another where the remote sensing is, is sort of at its at its limit, where it sort of bottoms out in terms of uh, its ability. Um, and so this dust OD was uh, um, calculated um, using a refractive index approach, and so um, the we we had this we had dust samples, and, and we basically estimated uh, what that lidar ratio was based on the refractive index. And so if we take that refractive index approach. Um, and uh, to calculate their LIDAR ratio, and we expand that over an effective radius, uh, we get a curve like this, depending on the, the, the sensitivity of those measurements. Um, and what's interesting to note here is that uh, if we try and calculate the LIDAR ratio with uh, the similar AOD measurements, uh, we get an effective radius of around, um, uh, around 20, 18 to 20. And so what we can see here is that um, this shows that it's in a little bit of a disagreement uh, with the refractive index approach, um, but it actually maybe suggests that um, our local sensors are actually not um, measuring a large enough range of diameters or radii uh, to actually constrain uh, the LIDAR ratio as measured by uh, the LIDAR for, for the AOD, uh, meaning that the PM10 limited measurements at the, at the ground uh, have no way of seeing um, the peak uh, that seems to be seen uh, in the Aeronet measurements uh, that seems to suggest, based on this uh, refractive index approach, that the, the majority of the dust passing over the, the simul station has uh, an effective radius perhaps of, of, of 10 microns, uh, which is much larger than what we can, we can kind of actively sense uh, with the measurements that we had in place at the time. Uh, I can just briefly talk about when the detection is successful. And so um, uh, K1 Ranjarar had a, had a, a 
uh, a paper in, in 2021 uh, where we were able to remotely sense a uh, dust event at 80 degrees north uh, within northern Canada. Um, and this was the help with, with various things, not including uh, a YouTube video of an ecologist that happened to be there during a dust event, uh, the dust event. And so uh, Kei Wang kind of went back through the catalog of, of remote sensing um, uh, availability images and, and came up with this, this beautiful uh, Mizar series, uh, which not only shows the plume of dust coming out of this valley, um, but Mizar has a lot of capabilities, which includes also um, getting the, the cloud height um, based on that uh, off NIDAR uh, sequence. Um, and so we were able to um, see this not only in the Mizar, but this was then confirmed uh, with with Kali up uh, because it was running at that time. Um, and so we can see uh, the dust kind of uh, plumed up there. And so some of the remote sensing um, approaches work is what I'm trying to say uh, when everything kind of aligns. Um, but we also probably need to have uh, some other uh, approaches uh, that are slightly different, I guess, or a modification of those approaches that we use at, at lower latitudes. Uh, so the second part that I'm going to talk about is uh, the emission dynamics. Um, so briefly to talk about the, the valley itself, uh, where I showed some of the results from before, is in southwestern Yukon. Um, and this is an area that has a change in the source of, of water from the, from the glacier system that has recently shifted. And so in the past, it's shifted several times over, um, but most recently in 2016, this has shifted again. And so the water from this Kafka Walsh Glacier was predominantly going into the Aochu, which goes into Luaman and the Yukon River, um, which Luaman is the largest uh, lake in the Yukon Territory. Uh, but now it's shifted towards the south and goes straight into the Gulf of Alaska. And we can see this quite easily on um, this series of landsat imageries. And I put a little circle to show you that there was an island um, that slowly is no longer an island. And so what it means is that not only did the glacier suddenly produce a lot of water and sediment deposit that aggregated that delta, that produced this very large deltaic sediment um, uh, surface, uh, but also the lake level dropped at the same time due to the lack of water uh, throughout the, the total year. And so suddenly we have um, in, in terms of climate change and, and dust emission processes, um, you know, a really strong case for why high latitude dust emissions might become a more predominant source a, as we move through uh, in the future. Uh, and so we've been lucky to have instruments at this location. This is the river valley. Um, there's really very, very small river at the moment. Uh, currently, um, this is an image from 2019 that shows some of the instrumentation that we have. Uh, at one site, we have some instrumentation kind of along the valley up to the glacier. Uh, Joe Bachelor was able to uh, uh, view some of these measurements uh, to come to some conclusions about some of the sediment processes, uh, transport processes uh, by measuring not only the dust emission, but some other uh, variables at the same time, uh, which includes some potential spalling or a different type of auto abrasion for the saltators that were producing the dust. Um, that also uh, gave way to, to really high uh, increase um, increases in, in arsenic and, and lead concentrations in the dust relative to uh, the soil sediments. Uh, in terms of erosivity, um, uh, Daniel Bellamy, uh, current PhD student, has, has been looking at this specifically to try and drive out, uh, see what the drivers are of the, the processes, whether they're synoptic or whether they're thermally driven. Um, and so this is an era five plot, uh, trying to correlate that with the PM10 emissions uh, concentration that we measure uh, within the valley. Uh, what you can see here is that although the era five seems to suggest quite a lot of wind around that area, um, it doesn't necessarily correlate with the, the increase in emissions that uh, we saw at one particular time versus, versus another. Um, and so he's gone a little bit further in that um, by uh, looking at some of our, our specific sites. And so um, we have a bunch of small stations uh, within the valley itself uh, that I showed a picture of before, uh, but there's some colleagues, glaciologists, that have stations a little bit further up the valley as well. And what we can see is that there's a general steering of uh, these, these synoptically driven winds uh, within the valley. And so although there's a strong case for thermally driven winds producing a lot of the emissions, um, and in particular, this valley seems to be um, at most a combination of the two for, for most of the large dust events, if not predominantly synoptically driven uh, throughout that process. 
And so the last section I'm just going to quickly talk about uh, is, is also some of uh, Daniel Bellamy's work uh, uh, in conjunction with Martina Closa at, at KIT, uh, where they've developed um, and, uh, a wharf model uh, for this region at uh, very high resolution. So um, it's nested at up to a 666 meter uh, resolution. Um, and the idea here was, was basically to see whether this would improve our estimations of, of wind speed at the surface relative to what we could get from reanalysis products um, or, or climate model products, um, but also go through the activity of, of applying a dust model and, and seeing sort of what surface characteristics are, are needed um, and, and changed and inputs are needed uh, for that. Um, and so the first example uh, of difficulty uh, um, met within that uh, is where um, snow cover is basically predicted uh, through the wharf model. And so we see a really large impact of this. Um, this is sort of the snow cover here, um, being red being snow and blue being no snow. Uh, we can see a huge impact on the valley's uh, heat flux, uh, upward heat flux, uh, due to those differences, which then has a, a feedback effect on the winds. We also see a large impact in terms of the land classifications. And so the valley here is uh, through the land classification at a high resolution, mainly derived from Landsat. Uh, this NALCMS product shows the valley completely filled with water. And so what Daniel has gone is, is try to use uh, some other Landsat uh, type data um, to, using infrared channels to basically extract uh, the portion that really is water or versus what which part is land uh, to provide an update. And so this is the updated uh, land classification map that you can see that we can input into WARF where you can then now see the river is just a small fragment of where it was uh, in the general land classification, obviously giving much more chance for, for wind erosion to occur. Um, and so this overall has uh, a, a large potential of increasing uh, the amount of emissions that we, we could be having. Um, and so in the past, that's been limited mainly by uh, soil characteristics. Um, and so we've been largely modifying the, the deterministic values associated with that, rather than looking at sort of the, the available land uh, for emissions. Um, and then in addition, uh, he's, he's gone through to try and see what those ramifications are. Um, and we can see clearly that the sand and clay contents um, are not realistic values values within these regions. And so this is a little bit larger scale view of, of the one I showed before. Um, yeah, and then my last slide here is um, um, uh, some work done uh, by Maria uh, Nikolokic, who uh, was an intern this summer uh, that worked with Daniel uh, from University of Maryland, uh, and who will be presenting this at the MS conference um, in the winter. Um, and so she used flex dust uh, to come up with emissions uh, for the wharf runs that, that Daniel has prepared uh, using FlexBart. And so this is just a, a small snapshot of one of those events. Um, and it actually does reasonably well. There's some there's some temporarily correlated uh, results and that we, we see dust coming out of the valley uh, when we, we actually measure it. Um, but generally the source areas uh, need further constraints, uh, again, due to this kind of sediment size um, and area availability uh, conundrum, as well as um, just the general magnitudes of, of the emissions occurring, uh, uh, less to do with the threshold uh, kind of uh, things that I've mentioned just recently, um, but more so the, the emission process in general. Uh, so that's it uh, I have today. I've tried to fit everything in. Uh, special thanks to sort of the people that have produced some of the work uh, that I put in today. Uh, and then also a thanks to uh, the uh, First Nations that we uh, were able to do conduct research on their land uh, for the portion in southern southwest Yukon. Thank you. So, uh, thank you, James, for, for this extremely interesting uh, presentation. So, I, I uh, suggest that we use the question and answer uh, section to, to look at some of the questions that the public can have. So let's first start with Franco. So um, he thanks you. And in addition to dust generated at high latitude, there is inflow of low latitude dust to the polar region. Do you have a feel of the relative magnitude of both types for the Arctic and Antarctic? Uh, I unfortunately have a very strong bias to, to Arctic 
northern environment, so I, I can't answer that question for, for Antarctic uh, specifically, but I know there's been um, uh, a, kind of a handful of studies to get an idea of what, what those contributions look like. Um, the number that seems, that I seem to recall, again, this is um, from Christine uh, Grushik's uh, work when she worked with Andrea Stahl using actually FlexBard and, and FlexDust, uh, was, was something uh, along the line of around 60% was being kind of advected, 60 or 70% um, uh, was being advected into the Arctic uh, from, from lower latitudes into higher latitudes. And so it's it's a larger proportion, um, but it, but it's, I would say it's not a, it's not a, a you know, a, significantly large portion, you know, it's not 90% or something like that. And so the emissions that were at least modeled uh, through that approach seem to suggest that the Arctic was producing um, a, a fairly good share of dust emissions on its own. So are there, are, are there are other questions for James from the public? Please don't be shy. Okay, in, the, in the meanwhile, uh, I, I might have uh, uh, one or, or, or two. So I, I was uh, wondering, uh, is there, there any idea of the interannual or the cadal trends? So there is, a, is there a way to like look at the position, for example, ice cores to, to try to understand yeah, how, how the dust source changed in the last decades or, or years? Yeah, so so uh, you know a lot more of that work has been done in the in the southern hemisphere, to be honest. So a lot of the work doing on uh, kind of fingerprinting using uh, relative isotopes uh, to look at where dust has been coming from into Antarctica, and so there's been actually a, a large body of work uh, to try and see at what point in the history, um, you know, southern America is a larger contributor than Australia or or, or southern Africa, um, which have been part of a, a little bit, um, but. In the northern hemisphere, um, my my impression is that that hasn't been done to the same extent. And so, if we look at the approach that's currently ongoing in uh, for northern Europe at the last glacial maxima, um, start of some of that 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 work has uh, started to come online. Where in the past it's been very much a sedimentological approach to see where, you know, the list has developed, um, you know, timing wise and and magnitude wise uh, in the past. Um, but people have started, researchers uh, specifically in France and Germany have started to do that in a much more uh, geochemically um, kind of approach, which, which would help answer that question in a little bit more detail. Um, uh, likewise, also kind of in, in list deposits in Alaska and, and northern Canada. Um, I'm not, not maybe the right person to answer that question. There's been some attempts looking at some of the snowpack. Uh, especially in the in the Colorados and in North America, on kind of that that seasonal component. So I think that there um, there are ways to do that. I think the the current approaches uh, could lead to doing that. But as I said, a lot of the tools that I think that are available uh, are limited by access to some of these these environments. Um, so I showed some results uh, from from some field campaigns and things like that within these regions. Um, unfortunately, a lot of this data is really hard. <laughs> Instruments do not like cold temperatures, especially those that have to have, maintain a flow through them. Um, and so a lot of that, a lot of this uh, work is, is on a small portion of data that was actually kind of recoverable in, in the large majority of things. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's probably a, an area to focus on in the future. There is uh, another question from uh, Huari Ben Musa. So she he asks about are there any other sun sources uh, apart from that of North Africa that might affect, I think, the Antar Arctic area? Uh, I'm not quite sure the the source of the question, but but I, what I didn't mention is kind of perhaps draw that link completely between where where this this dust and and um, wind erosion is coming from, you know, the mo majority of these sediments are glacial derived. And so um, depending on the location, whether you're in, you're in Iceland or whether you're in Greenland and, and Russia and North America for Arctic regions, um, you know, that, that sediment is either really fresh in the case of Iceland, uh, where you have volcanic uh, basalts being produced uh, kind of 
every day there uh, that can be eroded and, and, and emitted um, uh, to everything that's that's kind of Miocene and, 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 and older in the case of kind of Greenland and, and North America um, that are being going through that kind of glacier uh, erosion process and, and being kind of deposited in the near field from those, from those areas into these valleys, uh, which then are being exposed to the wind uh, during the periods when it's, when it's dry. Thank you. If there are no other questions, yeah, I have just the last one. So the what well, and maybe yeah, it's uh, most people know, but what what's the state of uh, the sources taking account for these sources in the climate uh, models uh, today? I mean, is there is are they considered already in a sort or or not? Uh, no, so generally, uh, in some cases, it depends on the model. So some cases they are, uh, as I mentioned, I alluded very quickly, um, sort of uh, Danny Long and uh, uh, Jasper Cox group has just published a paper this this summer um, that actually shows dust sources from, from high latitudes um, due to their approach that's not um, a, kind of a source area parameterization approach. And so in this case, you know, you're actually are generating them naturally from, from these high high latitudes. And this has a, is a combination of both uh, accounting for the smaller footprint of these emissions. And so they did some tests looking at the effect of the, the size of grids on, on their model and, and included that actually as a, as a factor to, to increase the emissions that they were having in the larger scale models. Um, and, but also in terms of just accurately uh, accounting for the effect of shear stress partitioning and, and sediment transport. Um, and so I think, you know, this is going in the right direction. I think some of our work using WARF and, and FlexBart help kind of uh, move in that direction on, on better constraining uh, the, the input variables that go into them so that we could actually include these in, in, in climate change models. I think we are almost there. It's uh, it's four. So if there are not any other questions, I I would like to thank again uh, James and uh, all the uh, participants to the webinars. And uh, um, so I we can close here. Thank you very much, everybody, and uh, see you for the next uh, webinar that will be announced uh, soon.